Hello everyone. We are back once again. I am Tim with Golf Cart Garage. I'm one of the technicians here at Golf Cart Garage. I'm a part of the Gearheads On Demand service that we offer. Gearheads On Demand is a service that we offer at Golf Cart Garage where you can schedule a phone call with me if you need to talk to someone about a specific golf cart issue that you may be having. If you need to talk to somebody with experience, I used to own a golf cart shop for many years, so I've seen a lot of problems. Sometimes I can help you fix your own cart. Sometimes I can just steer you in the right direction on what parts you might need or what you might need to do to get your cart going. Might be able to help you save some money. Uh, you can click the link in the description if you're interested in something like that, and that will take you to the scheduling page where you can either schedule a phone call with me where I will call you at whatever time you pick. I'll, I get notifications. It's all automatic. I get notified that, you, that you've scheduled an appointment or a phone call. Or you can schedule a video session where I'll send you a link at whatever time you picked and you just click the link on your phone and then I can see through your camera and I can see what you're pointing at in your garage or at your golf cart and sometimes that helps you know if, if it's something that I need to see in order to help you a video session might come in handy but uh, most of the time a phone call is, 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 is good enough okay and I have a list of questions here we are live uh, right now we're live on Facebook and YouTube this is July the 28th noon central time so if you're hearing me or seeing me and it's uh, Thursday the 28th you're seeing me live uh, let's see we might get some live people in the chat if there's anybody in the chat uh, that are, needs to ask a question feel free to I'm going to be checking the live chat periodically as I go through the regular questions well the garage is now open so let's get started with the regular questions let's see here question number one I have a 2008 Yamaha electric golf cart. This past weekend I hit the pedal to move the cart. It clicked and then after that the motor sounded like it was spinning but the cart would not move. I am unsure what I need to replace. Any suggestions? Well if you hear the motor spinning then there's a couple of things that you could have done or that could have happened. You didn't do anything wrong. It's a couple of things that could have happened. The, the motor itself has a coupler that slides onto the input shaft. It's direct drive onto the input shaft. So if you hear the motor spinning, you could have stripped something out there. You could have stripped out the input shaft or you could have stripped out the coupler on the end of the motor. Uh, and that could be what you hear spinning. It's just, it's just uh, spinning freely. On a Yamaha like of your year, you also have a splined hub similar to uh, the way EasyGo does it. EasyGo is incorporated into the brake hub itself and it's splined so the whole brake hub goes on. Well Yamaha does it a little bit different than that. They have a separate wheel hub and then a brake hub also. But their wheel hub is splined so it's splined onto the axle shaft. So what you can do to see if it's that one, if that's where your spinning is coming from, is you can take your hubcap, if you got hubcaps on, take your hubcap off. If you got a dust cover on there, you're going to have to remove the wheel, remove the dust cap, then put your wheel back on so you can see the axle nut. There'll be an axle nut there. Then go turn, turn your car on, hit the accelerator pedal, and see if you see that axle nut spinning. If it's spinning inside and your wheel's not, then you know it's stripped right there. That's just a couple of places. That's the only two places I can think of if you're hearing spinning. Because it's very unlikely that you damaged your gears. It's most more likely that you spun a hub, what is, which is a common thing, more common in easy goes than Yamaha, or you spun the motor coupler on the input shaft. All right. Number two. Just bought my first used easy go, and it was running good, backfired a couple of times after adding gas to tank then backfired loud and lost power. It started a few times after but not enough power to move. Now won't start. Any ideas? Well anytime you end up with a backfiring issue I, I immediately go toward the carburetor uh, because a lot of there's a lot of different ways that a car can can be can backfire but at this point since it's not running at all you, you just need to go down go back to the basics you just need to check for fuel spark and compression if 
fuel, spark, and compression. You've got to have all three of them things for it in order for it to run. So most likely you're missing one of those three things. So that would be uh, what I would do to start narrowing down the issue since the car doesn't run at all now. The backfiring could have been uh, your needle and seat not, not seating correctly the, in the float bowl of the carburetor that's full of gas. Could have, it could have sat there for a long time. You could have corrosion in there. It could not be sealing and therefore allowing gas to flow into the cylinder and therefore causing backfire issues sometimes. So it could be that, uh, but let's, let's go back to the basics and do fuel, spark, and compression first, and then we'll know which area we need to look at. Okay, number three. I have a club car that after charging and the next time I go to use it, it will not go. This is after unplugging the charger, it appears to go to sleep, and after 30 minutes or so, it will start and work fine. This has only happened in the last four months, before that, no problems. What would cause this to happen? Could it be the OBC or the controller? It it could be it could be the OBC or the controller, but let me let's let's uh, for the viewers that are listening to this, let's talk about what normal operation is because normal operation they would go to sleep in that occasion in, in your situation when you put them on charger they do what they, they will go to sleep but usually normal operation what will wake them up is you press the gas pedal like once or twice and it it'll wake up and then then you're good to go uh, but it, so from what you're describing it's staying asleep a lot longer than that you, you, no matter how many times you push the gas pedal it could be the sending a lockout signal to the controller. You could be getting a lockout signal that's sent to the controller. It, you know, when you plug your car in, when you to charge it, a lockout signal is sent to the controller in order to keep the car from driving off with the with the charger plugged in. That's normal. That's supposed to do that. But as soon as you unplug the charger, it's not sending that lockout signal anymore. So that's uh, where it could be the could be the OBC or the or the controller. Now something else though, it could be. It could just be an intermittent M core. M core is a very uh, common replaceable part on a on a club car. Uh, I've seen M core has a micro switch in it. You know, and when you hit the gas pedal, you're you're actually clicking a micro switch that causes the car to wake up in a sense, or causes and causes the solenoid to click. So it could be an intermittent micro switch in the M core. Now, let me see. What kind of car did you say you had? Let me go back from there. You just said it's a club car. Well, if it's an IQ club car, it would be easy for a dealer to plug in their computer to to look at that system, look at that M core, and see if that if it's working correctly. Uh, that might be worth it. And they they could also look at some fault codes and see if you see if you've built up any fault codes. If that's if this car is an IQ, that's probably what I would do if I was you and you had access to a club car dealer. Okay, let's go to number four. This is from Jim. 97 Easy Go 36 volt TXT won't go. My cart won't take a charge. 2019 batteries are showing charged at 38 volts. Well, if the uh, if it won't go, let's let's take each question one at a time. I don't really understand what you mean by it won't take a charge. Well, to you know, to figure that out, I mean, you, you obviously have enough voltage in your batteries at 38 volts for it, for that to work. So check your wiring from your charging receptacle. Make sure that it's hooked to the to the correct batteries. Your first the white wire goes to first battery positive. The black wire goes to last battery negative. Uh, well, actually, on your car, they're both on the same side, so they're actually real close to it. The first battery positive is uh, right there by the controller and then the battery behind it is actually the last battery negative in your battery configuration. If you'll follow positive, negative, positive, negative all the way around, you'll end back up almost where you started except the battery behind it. So check, make sure those are in the correct place. Uh, if you want to be 100% certain on your charger, you, know, uh, you need to put that charger in another golf cart. It's a very, very common plug, very common to, to be able to find. You should be able to find another 36 volt easy go with that same plug. You need to eliminate that charger as being the issue about the it not uh, not charging. Now, as far as it not running goes, uh, if the solenoid is not clicking, 
then it could be the reed switch. Your car has a reed switch inside the charging receptacle. Now, that, that it could be, you could have blown the reed switch, uh, and that would cause a solenoid, that would cause nothing to happen. That would be no reverse buzzer, no solenoid click. It could be the reed switch. Now, if your solenoid is clicking, then we've got a, you know, other electrical paths that we would need to follow. It, it uh, would need to check, make sure that your solenoid is fine. We would need to, uh, most likely at that point, it could be your controller. So, need a little more information basically before we can figure out which direction we need to go in in order to, to solve your issue. Number five, this is from Andrew. Club car FNR switch. I have a 2000 and a half 48 volt club car that I have remodeled with a six inch lift, 23 inch tires and added a rear seat. It ran fine for months. Then the original forward and reverse switch wore out and overheated. I replaced it with supposedly a heavy duty switch, which almost immediately overheated and melted the forward and reverse wire terminal. At that time, I also replaced all the battery wires with number four copper cables. I see several forward and reverse switches on your website and wanted to know which one you recommend guarantee will work and what to know if there is anything else you recommend I attend to. Okay. Let me uh, explain for the viewers the difference between you have a mechanical forward and reverse switch you, on your particular car. Your, your forward and reverse switch is a mechanical lever that you actually twist one direction and you twist the other direction. The only thing that is doing is like it is changing polarity, like it's putting positives and negatives in four different spots inside that forward and reverse switch. It's, making, it's changing the polarity to your motor to make it go in reverse. That's all that's doing. The only difference between a completely stock forward and reverse switch and a heavy duty forward and reverse switch, the only difference is those bus bars, those copper bus bars inside the switch are thicker on a, on a heavy duty forward and reverse switch. A lot of people just take their original forward and reverse switch and make, you can buy thicker copper bus bars and you cut them down to size and drill the holes in the right place and put them in the forward and reverse switch. You can actually do that yourself if you want to. Now, the it, overheating to the point where it's going to melt something, that is almost always caused by a loose connection or a uh, misaligned contact. Like, for some reason, you know, those forward and reverse switches need to be perfectly flat against each other. There's two moving parts, or there's one moving part, one stationary part with copper contacts and one moving part with copper contacts. Well, they actually need to be perfectly flat and you need to make sure that they're in the right spot, in the, exactly the right spot from forward to neutral to reverse. That's the only thing that I've seen that could cause something to get that hot. Now, if you wanted to uh, completely eliminate that type of switch, because you, do, you did mention that you have a six inch lift and 23 inch tires. Well, that aids to your, your, heating, your heating up of cable problems also. That, that adds to it, the fact that you're running 23 inch tires. You know, and the car is lifted. Uh, that that puts a little bit more of a strain on your electrical system. So at the least, you needed to upgrade all your power wires to four gauge, and that's the least you needed to do. Some people would even go through the trouble to not only do that. I have seen people. I've done it myself too. They have eliminated the, the mechanical forward and reverse switch, and they have gone with what is called reversing contactors, which involves two solenoids where it changes your car to not being mechanically polarity uh, driven to you push a button and those two solenoids click, click. One of them clicks on, one of them clicks off and that's forward and, and they do the opposite and then that's reverse and you got push button forward and reverse. You can do that in your in a series car if you go to these reversing contactors. You can, uh, you can look that up on Google. Just plug in reversing contactors and you'll see what I'm talking about. Or golf cart reversing contactor. Okay, we'll go to, let's go over to Facebook and YouTube for a second just to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Looks like I'm good. Nobody's in the chat right now. Anybody in the chat say, what's up, Tim? I'll get to you in a minute. Number six. 
number six is voltage issue. I have replaced the voltage regulator and I'm still getting 17 volts back to the battery. New starter and solenoid. Well, I'd like to know what your make and model of your car is because some voltage regulators are adjustable. The voltage is adjustable that it goes to the battery. Uh, you take the lid off the older, if it's an older car, it might be an adjustable voltage regulator. Uh, and it's, it's very easy, you just there, you take the lid off and turn a screw. But if it's not adjustable, now I couldn't tell you how many times I've, I've uh, been talking to somebody and they're telling me uh, that they're getting an unusually high reading off of something. And it's happened to myself many times too. And that they continue to get unusually high readings. And it turned out to be the battery in their voltmeter. Apparently, these digital voltmeters, when that battery gets low, they will start reading high. They'll start reading high. If they don't give you a low battery indication, they'll, they'll read like on a 12-volt on a battery, they'll read like 14 or 15 volts when that battery starts getting low. So I would want to eliminate that first. You know, that's, uh, this is, that's what this golf cart repair game is all about, is you eliminate things first. And the 17-volt the, the, uh, the back to the battery, make sure that that is correct. Like either verify it with a second voltmeter or put a new battery in your voltmeter and see if you're still getting 17. That does seem a little bit high. I've seen as much as 15, a uh, little over 15 and it's everything's perfectly normal at that in that range, but 17 does seem a little bit high. Okay, number seven. Charger trip breaker. I have a 94 EasyGo Medalist and it was on the charger fine and all. I took the cart out real quick and when I plugged it back in the charger it made kind of a whining noise and looked to spark inside and then trip my breaker. I opened up the charger and I can't seem to find any damage or trip fuses. Any idea where to proceed from here? And it's a 94 EasyGo Medalist. Okay, <clears throat> the charger used for a 94 EasyGo Medalist, especially if you saw Sparks, is going to be one of those older, heavy transformer type chargers. There's, there's only a few parts inside that charger and they're all readily available and replaceable. Uh, let me see, did you say you replaced? No, you didn't, okay. Okay, well, most likely, if you saw sparks, most likely what that was was the diodes. That charger has two diodes inside of it. And I have seen those just bust and explode. Uh, you can look up the test for testing a diode. You, there, there is an easy test to test diodes to see if they're still functioning. All a diode does is it only allows electricity to flow in one direction. It, it, it will flow that way, but it will not flow that way. It's a safety device. It will not let electricity go back the other way. So uh, it, most likely it's your diodes, but the, the only parts, the, the most common parts inside of a charger that go bad inside of that type charger, you've got capacitor, you've got a relay, you've got a circuit board, and you've got diodes. And well, you also have a transformer, but it's very unlikely that it's the transformer. That would be the last thing. You know, it does happen, but it doesn't happen near as common as the other four items. And none of these four items are that expensive. Well, the circuit board itself could be expensive. Uh, it could be over $100 for the, for the circuit board itself. Uh, but if you saw sparks, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't think it was the circuit board. I'm thinking the diodes if you saw sparks. Number eight, this is from Travis. I have questions about my 99 Club Car DS. When hitting the gas from a dead stop, the engine will make like it's trying to start, then it will make a loud squeal, almost like a belt squeal, then the cart will go. However, it takes several seconds before the cart will go. You basically just have to hold the gas down and sit and wait. I have purchased new belts but have not installed them yet. I'm not sure if it's just the belts or maybe some other issue. That's Travis. I'm 
can almost assure you, Travis, you're on the right track. It's not, it's not your belts, it's your starter belt. It's the, that squeal noise is the, if you look at your starter generator on the car, it's got a big pulley on the end of it and the belt rides on that pulley. Well, sometimes if the belt's not tight enough, that pulley will spin inside the belt because the compression of the motor is holding it back for a little bit and the, the pulley will spin inside the belt and it will squeal. It makes a loud squealing noise. Uh, if you do put on a new belt, just make sure you get it tight enough. What you can do is on your car is uh, to, to verify what I'm saying is you can crank your car in neutral. Uh, and, and if you don't know how to do that, if you'll look behind your Okay, you know how your forward and reverse lever is on the outside of the cart, like behind your right knee? Well, look at the back side under the seat. Look at the back side of your forward and reverse lever. Right in the center of it, on the back side, there is a yellow plastic cam about the size of a quarter. It's yellow and plastic. You, you can't miss it. You pull that out. You grab it with your finger and your thumb like this, like this. You just put your finger and thumb, pull it out about a half an inch or so, you turn it 180 degrees and let it go and it pops back in in a different position. Now your car will crank in neutral. So you can put it in neutral, gear shift lever, you know, in between forward and reverse. Step on the accelerator pedal, raise your seat up and your car will crank in neutral and you can sit there and rev it up. And I bet you'll see that, what I'm talking about, you'll see that pulley slipping inside that belt and the motor not turning over. As soon as the motor starts turning over, you know, it, it'll crank up. So anyway, try that. That's that because uh, when you put the new belt on, just make sure you get it tight enough. That starter belt needs to be pretty tight. Number nine. This is from Mike. Yamaha golf cart. I just installed new batteries in the golf cart, and it only travels a short distance and then dies. Is it the relay? I don't know what you mean by by relay, but what I would need when it dies, if it only travels a short distance and then dies, then I would want battery readings at the point where it died. I, whenever it dies, I would like need to see the voltage of your batteries just to make sure that there's nothing to do with that. If it's not that, then you've got something heating up, and uh, you know as you're driving, and then it heats up and then and then shuts down. Uh, most likely the device that would do that would be your controller. Your controller could be going bad. You know, that, if that's, that may be what you mean by the relay. Anyway, the, the, the speed controller, the big box that with all the big power wires connected to it, that can heat up to a point and then, and it feels just like your batteries went dead. It's called thermal shutdown. You know, it, it, your car will go dead and you'll think your batteries are dead, but it's just actually the controller just got too hot. Uh, that could be, that would be my next guess on that one. I just need more information in order to be, to be accurate. This is number 10. This is from Arthur. I have a new club car villager two plus two LSV electric. The pedestrian alert system PAS makes an annoying sound in forward and reverse. This is not the same as the reverse only sound you mentioned in your YouTube presentation. How can I disable the PAS pedestrian alert system, which is incredibly noisy? Thanks for your help, Arthur. It's a very interesting question. And the, weird, the reason that this question is interesting is because that is the first time I've ever been asked that question. I've been asked over the years, I've been asked thousands of questions and I have never been asked that question before. So Arthur, if I had a prize, I would give it to you. You asked me a question that I've never had before. I understand what you're saying. I would not, this is what I would do in that case. The pedestrian alert system apparently is some type of motion detector that uh, if you, if it senses that something's behind you and you go in reverse, it, it makes a noise. If it senses that something's in front that you can't actually see over the front of the car, if it senses something out there, it's going to make a noise. I'm assuming that's what it is. Uh, what I would do instead of disabling it, I would, I would never recommend disabling that. Uh, in fact, there may be some liability issues if I, you know, wish to, to, disable that or even or even say something about disabling it 
what I would do is I would find it. I would find wherever that sound is emanating from. It's obviously emanating from somewhere. It's either got a, a, a buzzer just like the reverse buzzer. You know, the reverse buzzer is actually a buzzer inside your car. When you find it, you could take the wire off and the reverse buzzer won't work anymore. Well, I would find the PAS uh, speaker or buzzer or whatever it has, and I would just quieten it down a little bit, like put some tape on it or uh, put a uh, earplug. If it's got a hole like a, like the reverse buzzer, put an earplug inside that hole and it'll quieten it down a lot. I, would, I, I shouldn't recommend disabling it is what I'm saying. But anyway, thank you, Arthur, for the question. That's the first time I've ever had, has been asked that question. Let me go check YouTube and Facebook one more time. Don't look like I have anybody on YouTube. Go to Facebook. No, it looks like it's clear there. Anybody in the live chat, feel free to ask a question or say something. Let's see. We're going to go to question 11 now. I have a 1996 Club Car 48 volt. The voltmeter didn't work. That was original. That was original, and a golf cart repair place put one in that looks like this. Apparently, you tried to inst uh, include a picture, but I don't. I don't have a picture of what you're talking about. I don't know if it's working right. Rarely, when I charge, does it go all the way to the right. In a few days of little use, it has moved to the left and is blinking, and I assume it wants to be charged, so I charge the batteries. Do I have just a battery issue or a battery and voltmeter issue? By the way, I do understand the batteries are not good. They are about five years old, but charge okay, and I maintain them and trying to get life out of them. In the meantime, this voltmeter issue is just bugging me. Well, the your batteries are five years old. I mean, I, I would, I would, I'm a, I'm a Trojan battery dealer. I've been a Trojan battery dealer for years. I tell my customers that when they buy a new set of Trojans that they can expect uh, anywhere between four and five years is a safe bet that you can that you can get out of your Trojans. So if your battery voltage meter is way down and starting to blink, that's when I would want real battery readings off voltage readings off of your batteries it may be telling you that you just got low voltage that's all there is to it and if you're trying to squeak out more time out of your batteries there's there's not going to be any fix for that it might just be time for a whole new set of batteries that's what i would assume at this point since uh, your batteries are over five years old uh, but like I said, when your voltage meter is down and starts blinking, th then I would want battery readings off your batteries right there, right at that time. And, I'll, and depending on what your voltages are at that point, I would, I would be willing to bet they're low. And that's, that's causing your, all your, your issues. Let's see here. We'll go to number 12. Charge clicking back and forth. I have an easy golf cart. I guess it means easy go golf cart that had a dead battery. Replace that battery. That battery hook up to my charger and charger keeps clicking back and forth from power to charging and charged and then back back the power and it still won't work. I have a Yamaha 48 volt charger multi-stage. Okay, the f first thing I would do is I would take that charger, plug it into another Yamaha, find another Yamaha, go to another, go to a Yamaha dealer, whatever you got to do to find another Yamaha, plug that charger into another Yamaha and make sure that that charger is working correctly. That's, you know, just eliminate that as the issue. Then I'd want you to go back. Let's just say that it is, it works fine on another car. Uh, so you know it's not the charger. You know it's something to do with your batteries. All right. Well, at that point, I'm going to want to take some battery readings. The first reading that I would want to take would be inside the charging receptacle. That's correct. Your charging receptacle, where you plug the charger in, put your voltmeter leads inside, one in each hole. And you should be getting full battery pack voltage right there. It should be over 48 volts. That's where, I'd want, that'd want, that's where I want the first reading. And then we'll go from there. 
Uh, then that's if your charger worked on another car. Obviously, if you did the same thing on another car, then you've got some parts inside your charger that, we're gonna, that you're going to need to be looking into get, getting replaced. Okay, number 13. Hi, Tim. I have a 1968 Harley Davidson utilizer. It runs but won't accelerate. This is 13. Okay, I'm 1968. I'm going to assume we're talking about a gas car because uh, you said it runs but won't accelerate. All right. Uh, well, the first thing, this like I was like one of the other questions, one of the previous questions, is you're going to have to verify fuel spark and compression. Now, on a 68, that's going to be a two-stroke. Okay, so if that motor has never been uh, redone, if that's all original and everything, two-stroke all original from 68, I mean, I have an old two-stroke myself, and it's 88. So, I mean, 68 is just 20 years older than that. It's a 50-year-old car. So, one of the things that those two-strokes, one of the things that goes bad over time there's nothing you can do about it. It wouldn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of maintenance you did or how good you were at maintenance. Eventually, your crank seals are going to go out. Once those crank seals start going out, you start. It starts messing with your fuel to air ratio. Once that starts happening, the car starts running bad. It gets worse and worse and worse. Eventually, your crankcase pressure will not even be enough to pump the, to operate the fuel pump. So you start end up with fuel issues. So when you tear down one of those old two strokes, that's the most important thing that you need to change. A lot of people think, oh, I just need a new top end, need a new piston and ring. That's not the case in these older ones. You need new crank seals. That's the most important thing. Of course, you need a new piston and ring too, and you need to get the top end right. But the crank seals are in the bottom. You've got one on each side of the crank, and those need to be good and tight and sealed up. And that, that, helps, get, that helps make everything else work correctly when your crank seals work. So it could, it could very easily be that, but verify fuel spark and compression, you know, first. And then if you, if you, you know, if you've got all those, which, which I bet you don't, I bet you're missing one of them, it could be fuel and the, and the fuel missing fuel could be either the fuel pump itself, or it could be crank seals, not, not operating enough in order to operate the fuel pump. That's what I was saying. That's why the crank seals are very important. They're like the foundation of everything else. All right, number 14. I have a Yamaha 2002 22E. My issue is that the brake pedal doesn't retract. How can I fix that? Well, lucky for you, a Yamaha uh, G22, the floor mat is very easily removable. It's got some, some push pins type rivets that you push and you can remove the floor mat. Once you remove the floor mat, you'll see there's an access panel. There's an access panel under that floor mat. You don't even need any tools in order to remove the access panel. It's just laying there. You just grab it and you pick it up. Now at that point, you can see your brake. You can also see the springs involved with retracting your brake. You can also see the cables and everything right there. Look in that area, push your brake a few times, and you'll see what, how it's supposed to work. You might see an area that you might need to squirt some WD-40 on. It might just be sticking or something like that. Or you might find that you have a broken spring. You know, might, might have a broken brake spring. Uh, you might also find you've got a stick jammed up in there. I've seen that before, uh, you know, because uh, that, that, that spot under the golf cart is vulnerable to sticks, you know, getting caught up in there. So you could have some type of uh, plant or stick or wood or or anything, a rock even. I've even seen rocks in that area. So I would check that out and you'll, you should be able to figure it out once you look at it. Let's see, number 15. This is from Jamie. I have a fuel injected club car. How do I make it go faster? Uh, well, a lot of people right off the bat, they would say, uh, Oh, you can tweak the governor, you know, because it's, it's got a governor, so you get the governor tweak. Well, 
That is true. You can make it go a little bit faster by tweaking the governor. Okay. I would only recommend you doing that if you know what you're doing or if you're at a club car dealer or somewhere where the mechanic himself actually knows what he's doing. Because uh, I, I don't like to recommend tweaking the governor because a lot of times what it does is it causes your car to go a little faster, but you actually lose the ability to drive slow. Like when, you, when you're trying to creep around really slow, if you've got your governor screwed up real tight and you're trying to go real slow to look for snakes or whatever you're doing, look, you know, throwing out hay or, or, or shooting hogs or whatever you're using your car for, it will jerk and it's very hard to find that, that sweet spot to go really, really slow. With the, uh, with the governor in the right position, you've got, you've got perfect slow speed driving ability and you've got you know, decent uh, speed. So in, the, in other words, my recommendation to speed up a gas car, if it's completely stock, if you, you know, just like your car is, then it would probably be just to go with high speed gears. You don't have to mess with your governor. You're just going to change your gear ratio. Now, keep in mind that that is only going to, uh, it's going to decrease your torque a little bit because you're basically running around in second gear rather than first gear when you put high speed gears in there. So it may, it may decrease your torque a little bit. Now gas cars are able to compensate for that a lot better than electric cars are because of the clutch, the way their clutch system works with the centrifugal clutch and the driven clutch, the, the, the drive clutch and the driven clutch. They're constantly changing gear ratios. So they help compensate. So high speed gears in a gas car, that would be, that would be the way that I would do it. 16 let's see hi Tim I need some help I have a 2004 club car DS oil on the inside of the rear hub see pictures you guys are awesome you have helped me before well thank you Dan thanks for saying that and I'm looking at the picture and I can tell you this if that oil on that tire dripped out of that hub right there it dripped out of there then there's no doubt about it you've got a bad what is called an axle seal you got a there's an axle seal i don't know if you can see my pointer or not but there's an axle seal right in that area uh that keeps this oil from going down this tube that's gear oil is what that oil is that's gear oil it's coming from your differential and it's it has actually gotten past two seals. I believe there's another one way over toward the differential and there's an axle seal right there we're close to where the bearing is at. So you've, you're getting, you're either got your, your differential is either too full and it's filled up this tube and it's leaking out there or you've got a bad axle seal, one or the other. There's no doubt about it. Alright, let's see number 17. Let's see. How is brake light switch installed on an easy go cart? Do you remove the brake pedal and is the switch part of the pedal? I've never seen a, a brake light switch for an easy go where you have to remove the brake pedal. The, there's a couple of different types though. There's one type that involves uh, micro switches and it mounts up under the golf cart and when you hit the brake it just pushes a micro switch and it's under the golf cart because the brake pedal itself you know starts on top of the floor mat but then it extends and goes under the golf cart well they've, they've got there's a there's a type where there's a micro switch that you mount under and it, when you hit the brake it just tap, taps that micro switch and you know and that turns your brakes on that's one type I've seen another type where it is basically just a pad that with adhesive, some type of adhesive on it, and it just it just kind of sticks to your brake pedal itself, and then every time you put your foot on that pad, that, that pad is actually a switch, and it activates the switch, and that activates your brakes. So that's the, that's the two types I'm familiar with for easy goes. Alright, let's see, number 18. We have an older easy go cart golf cart partly in gear with throttle off so we put in neutral to keep it from moving I think I understand what you're saying uh, 
you've got what is called a ghost rider golf cart. In other words, it's drive by itself if, if no, with no one that was in it. Well, obviously that means that your activation circuit for your solenoid, whether it's gas or electric, doesn't matter. It'd be the same in either case. Your activation circuit is closed. Your, your accelerator pedal is already activating the micro switch. Uh, if you're having to put it in neutral to stop it, so it's not supposed to be the case. So you've got something out of adjustment there. You've got a, you, your, your solenoid is always on, in other words, if, you know, unless you put it in neutral. So you got to figure out what's wrong there. You know, was, did something happen to this? Did this start all of a sudden, or did uh, some grandkids get in the car and go riding around in it and go in the woods and not tell you that they hit a tree or something like that? Because uh, I've seen that many, many times. Uh, so you you've got something bent or you've got something out of adjustment all of a sudden for some reason. Uh, so you're going to have to figure out why your gas pedal is actually activating the micro switch without your foot being on it. Okay, looks like that's all of the regular uh, regular questions. Go over to Facebook and YouTube, see if we got anything. I'm showing on YouTube, there's a question from Doreen O'Brien, but the message was retracted. Let's see, what's up Doreen O'Brien? Not showing anybody on Facebook. All right. Before I forget, uh, don't forget to go to golfcartgarage.com. Look for this. Look for this logo. We have our, We've actually picked the winner the, for, the, for season two, and that winner will be announced later on. There's going to be a video released, and that winner will be announced. But there's several videos over there that you can look at for good information. Uh, if you want to go over there and check out the the videos that Dave has done for season two, you can go back and learn a lot of stuff. Uh, the, the winner for, will be announced like in a couple of weeks or something like that. So go to golfcartgarage.com, look on, look for Extreme Golf Cart Makeover Season 2, and you can, uh, there's a lot of nice info there. Also, again, I am a part of the Gearheads On Demand service at Golf Cart Garage. And uh, Gearheads On Demand is a service that we offer where you can schedule an appointment with me, and I will call you. Uh, or I'll send you a link and and uh, take control of your camera on your phone and I can see what you're pointing at and help you with your golf cart related issue. If you're interested in that service, uh, click the link in the description and that will take you to the scheduling page and you can schedule your appointment phone call or you can schedule your appointment video call with me, not video session, it's not a video call because I don't actually call you but I do send you a link when, when it's a video. Uh, it's very easy. Just fill out the information at the time that's convenient for you, and I'll be there. And our, myself or one of the other technicians will be there. And we'll try to help you with your whatever your golf cart issue is. All right, let me look at Facebook and YouTube one more time just to see if there's anybody. Not seeing anything. Well, thank everybody for watching. I see, I see people in the live chat. Thank you all for coming. I will be back next week, just as usual, on Thursday at noon. We will be live again next Thursday at noon, Central Time. Well, the garage is now.